Hey everybody, hope everybody's doing well today. I'll give it another couple minutes, wait for, see if a few more people wander in before we get going. So it looks like we may have a fairly light audience today, but um, I figure we should get going and and move ahead anyhow. Um, I think today on the agenda, there's a couple topics. One is Osama continued discussion um, about scone, and the other is if we have time to potentially go in and look at um, the current uh, set of issues and, and perhaps discuss next steps there and um, potentially um, any additional topics or ideas that folks have on their mind that they'd um, like to get uh, seen covered in this forum. So um, with that, unless somebody has something urgent to insert at the beginning, an announcement or anything, I will turn it over to Osama. All right, thanks. So I will wait, should, I, should we wait for couple of minutes to see if some, someone else wants to talk about some other topic. Um, I, 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 th I think you're green to go. Um, oh. That can always be covered at the end, so. Sure. Okay. okay. Uh, right. Um, Okay, so uh, before I start, Greg, I have one screen again, so uh, please feel free to interrupt in between if there is something in the chat, so I will not be monitoring that. Um, welcome, everybody. So we have a status update on the tested TLS formal verification, which we have been discussing for a while. Um, uh, I, I recall that I never really talked about more of the motivation in the previous meetings and we just started straight away starting with the what's what's in there and what we have done and so on so i i kind of uh, go through first with the small kind of motivation of why this is actually important for a, a formal analysis or formal verification and for others also feel free to interrupt in between this is meant to be more like um, discussing the topics rather than just presenting and it's still a work in progress. We are not yet done. So there's a lot to be done. And that's part of the discussion that what needs to be done precisely and what would be, that's a more valuable direction uh, to be verified and formally analyzed. So with that, I think for this audience, the most important motivation for formal analysis is really the standardization, which means that the Attested TLS falls, uh, the most closely related working group for this is the TLS working group. And TLS working group has a new working group adoption process for the internet drafts, which is that it will not lose any of the guarantees which has which have already been established. And a long uh, five or six year process has been done for that in various tools like Tamarin, ProVerif and so on and crypto verif as well. So many, many different verification works have been done and uh, it's now formally added as a part of the process that the formal verification triage group will have a look at what kind of extensions are being done to the 
TLS protocol. And if they are non-trivial, they will go through a process of formal verification. And a tested TLS is definitely one of those which will um, go through this thing because it's uh, adding a lot of things to the base protocol itself. And then there are some other things which are like from a technical perspective, um, it's really important from confidential computing that it's a fundamental building block and we really want to have some good guarantees in addition to the standardization process or kind of independent of that. And now confidential computing is being increasingly used in various artificial intelligence applications and to evaluate the trustworthiness of these applications, um, the regulations such as the um, and the acts like AI Act, GDPR, and so on, they are coming into action. And that's where it's important to analyze what are the underlying trust assumptions. That's what we aim to be looking at in the in the long run um, eventually. So this is kind of what forms our um, three-step motivation for that from a standardization perspective, from technical perspective, and as well as ethical and legal perspective of the regulations and the ethical imperatives. With that, so this is um, a little bit of transformed um, architecture for generically describing how do we think about these kind of architectures. We have a workload and the overall goal of this whole architecture is to analyze how will I, as a workload owner, provision secrets or secret could be anything which is represented in red here in this um, diagram. And it could be configurations, secrets, or any keys or such, such things. So generically represented here as configurations or secrets. And the idea is that what would be the whole architecture that will enable this kind of architecture for a confidential computing uh, workload. And this is the breakdown that we have in mind and comparing it to the Rex architecture, uh, which was uh, Greg's question uh, uh, last time. So I can think of this workload as an attester and this secret broker is generally again representing um, that it could be for KBS, for instance, the key broker. And we generally use a more generic name, which, which is because it could not necessarily be a key. It could also be some configuration or some other secret, for instance. Um, and then there is the, so, so this acts as the relying party at a high level, high level view or the macro view, so to say, for the whole architecture. And this, as the name says, is acting as the verifier from the RACS perspective uh, of, of this architecture at a high level view. And the two entities on the top, this is the verifier owner providing the configuration to the verifier and the workload owner providing some security policy and the secrets to the secret broker to be forwarded to the workload. So this is the kind of architecture and to map it to, or to, or, or to concretely think about it from, from trustee perspective, um, you can think of this workload as the, as the, as is the workload in general. And this one as the KBS block, and this is their attestation service. And then um, the workload owner is provisioning the secret to the KBS and the verifier owner is governing this verifier. So this is kind of representing um, in our understanding generically different architectures, which in a specific application provision the secrets to the confidential computing workloads. So um, that's all my well given her. Sure. Interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to me, this looks like the background check model from the RATS architecture perspective. Is that true? Is it assuming yes. background check versus the passport? Sure. That is, uh, yes, that's the background check model. So this, uh, okay. the line party talks directly to the uh, workload mm -hmm. for the tester. And is that is there an intentional statement being made there about background check versus passport, or is this just a, kind of an ordering thing? Do a background check first, or is this a, you know just just what's what's the thinking there? Okay, so the thinking in this um, specific architecture is to understand how the background check model works, 
and then in the later stage move to the passport to see how that's uh, going to work in the because scone which i'm going to talk about a bit in the in a few minutes like would be would be following more like of this architecture so um that's that's uh, our understanding so far uh, to, to focus on the background check first and then we will move on to the passport one okay okay so there's no it's not like you've discovered or had any particular opinion on um perhaps like the passport architecture is is you know deprecated or anything like that or has some issues and and is, or or vice versa it's just a, no, no, no. yeah yeah it's just an ordering kind of thing hey you're, you're yeah okay yeah it's just a it's just a priority let's say to to um not even a priority i mean this it's just a starting point so to say to uh understand this which is more intuitive and then move to the passport because uh, this is just a continuation of all the work that we have been doing uh, in the SIG from the, uh, let's say, the formal verification perspective, because we have always assumed this to be background check, and this was just a natural extension to that, where we are combining now the architecture level specifications, which we did in one of the projects, to the network protocol, um, like the TLS and um, just as a natural continuation, we will first analyze this, and then we will analyze the passport one. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, right. Cool. Any other any other co comments or questions? Okay. If not, then I will continue. Um, so the having understood uh, the main blocks in this. The legend shows that the temporic, temporally, like in time scale, it will happen in this order that we have the verifier owner providing the configuration, the workload owner providing the security policy and secret to the secret broker, and then the secret broker providing the security policy to the verifier, and then finally the secret broker providing the configuration and secret to the workload. Um, so there are at a in the beginning I said this is a macro kind of a level of rats and within that there is a micro kind of thinking of the of the rats also which i will explain a little bit late which is that from this perspective of number one if we if we focus on this part only this is kind of acting as a verifying relying party so the arrows are going from the verifying relying party to the attester in this sense so the verifier owner basically trying to gather some evidence about attester uh, the verifier in this case which is the attester and then provision the configuration to this. Um, so we, we have many open questions about the first two steps, um, which are mostly unspecified. Anyway, uh, then similar idea applies to two, three, and four. So whichever party is providing the secrets, naturally it is, uh, it is willing to know the status of the other party before providing it with the secrets. And then a separate world is the TLS world, which is that the two endpoints are also shown in this purple color, which is showing that in this kind of connection, this will act as client from TLS perspective, and this will act as a server, and so on for other connections um, shown here. Particularly, the workload will act as the client, and the secret broker will act as the server. It will start the so so by definition, client in TLS means the party initiating the TLS protocol. Right, so. So the idea of this whole showing all of this is basically there are two different worlds which are interacting, the TLS world and the remote attestation world. And um, the need to, they, they, they have to be integrated basically. And this I already explained the four stages, uh, what happens, whoever is the verifying relying party and attester. And after that it's providing basically these uh, secrets or provisioning basically. Okay, now comparing this architecture to, uh, and before that, some intuition for this. So, Scone, what it what it believes is that basically for this step three, the secret broker should have a built-in or a small verifier inside in order to verify this uh, verifier before providing it with the security policy. And that's where it's um, the intuition is that why not combine the two entities and have 
use the same verifier and then we don't need to basically so basically a single attestation service and then we don't need to have this step three inside so the architecture then in that case basically changes to something like this which the combination they call as configuration and attestation service and the rest of the thing things pretty much remain the same which is that we have the step one step two in this case it's the configuration of costs compared to this configuration and inside the security policy they already have the secrets provision within so it's only the security policy that that's just their definition whatever they call it so um not some technical difference and hey, hey osama yeah i i just just um thinking out loud here but i mm -hmm. think um this slide would be more understandable if mm -hmm. i think the big change here is there's just no that the if you go back one slide yes please the big change here is that the secret broker and verifier are now packaged essentially in the same component. So there's no need for yeah. the attested TLS to, to go between the two. Sure. And, and it might just help the, the if like the block in the next slide, mm -hmm. if you just still show those two subcomponents on, you Inside know, as part of room. configuration and that, then it makes clear yeah. that it's yeah. really, mm -hmm. it's the same, all the same building blocks just packaged differently. Yeah. Uh, the because, uh, 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 right. I think the, mm, yeah, by removing this arrow. So yes, I can. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Uh, yeah. But, but because all the same functionality has to yeah. exist, right? It's just, sure, sure. it's mm -hmm. just how it's packaged. And as you point out, that was a great insight. Um, one, I think lots of people miss a lot is you need a verifier for the verifier. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that all makes sense. Yeah, right. Uh, good, thanks very much. Yeah, I, I completely but, agree. So, so is it the case that this, the step three on the previous slide, the step three interactions still exist? They're just under the covers? Like you're choosing not to analyze them from a protocol perspective because they're- I think they, know, I, the, I, the way, the way I interpret it is the functionality still exists. The same, the same logic still flows. It's just the code packaging, the verifier, the the code that's you know executing what we think of as a verifier now mm -hmm. is co-located with the secret broker, and you know it, it's it's um you know the, the the same functionality has to happen, right? You have to verify the attestation evidence from the workload, right, by the verifier. Right. Um, that's. So, yeah. So, so the like the thing labeled security policy that goes from secret broker to verifier that still exists yeah. somewhere under the covers, and it just falls to some some bit of code that's kind of doing the same thing, just not in the context of a TLS exchange, but maybe some application level exchange. I, I would assume so, but right? well, yeah. let us almost speak to it. <laughs> so my my understanding, of course, uh, this is a closed source and not much specifications are available. My understanding of this thing is that basically they do not have a precise, um, let's say, a segregation between the two, and they combine it such that it's um, it's no longer required to have this kind of thing. That is the two blocks are merged together such that I don't really need to think about that this entity is separately at the application level providing something to this because the two are uh, kind of, I'm looking for the word kind of intermingled together such that I cannot really think of the two entities as a separate separate entity any longer. Or, 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 or perhaps uh, th thinking about uh, uh, writing code Right. Yeah. Uh, conceptually, the the thing that security policy represents has to has to exist somewhere. Um, and a lot of times, as code evolves, right. Initially, it's just coded straight into the code, right. And then over time, yeah. you move it into data structures, and over time, you move you know into you know external um, persistent repositories that can be manipulated by you know additional tools and things like that. So and there's uh, the and as Osama says, it's a, I guess it's a black box, uh, closed source with uh, scone stuff. Um, so you don't really know how it works under the covers, I think is what I heard. Yeah, that, that's my understanding so far. Like uh, the two are strongly 
connected together that we cannot uh, let's say distinguish between the two and there is no need to um, provide this to this because the two are basically all together. The two entities are together then inside. But the verifier may not be generic that's driven by you know security policy uh, you know data. It may be coded specifically with security a specific security policy in mind. So it's we yeah. don't know. I think probably maybe maybe it helps in discussion. So it's currently only focusing only on SDX. There is a work underway for AMD and uh, TDX, but currently it's only uh, providing services for SDX. So that's probably one of the reasons that this segregating this was not a need, and at some point in time they might need to uh, closely de-associate the two things into this verifier such that it can provide services for AMD, SGX, and TDX, and so on for this, for RCC and so on. So, so you can make a, a stronger statement that the, maybe the black boxes refer to, you know, trust boundaries? boundaries uh, yeah so, you, so the secret that. broker the secret broker exists within some kind of a protected ex, uh, you know confidential computing environment mm -hmm. yeah is that is that something you intend to say yes that, that that should exist under cca so i will quickly jump to a more detailed slide which is something like this so the costs uh, that i showed in that slide is basically running also under uh, a confidential computing platform that is under SGX. So this is this is with the DCAP based, uh, there is uh, other also like Apid based Cone has its own coating on Clave, um, but it, it definitely has to run over a confidential computing platform. Otherwise, of course, there is no guarantee then the secrets are all lost. Is that what you wanted to say, Ned? Yeah, just just poking to see if that was intended. Looks like it, it okay. was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Then um, going a little back, this slide. Uh, okay. So this slide I have shown uh, quite a few times, and this is about design options for attested TLS. So. I, I talked about the three, uh, not the three. I mean the two of the two of the different words that we combine, which is the attestation here represented by signing of evidence and the TLS, more specifically the handshake part. And we can do it in three ways. That is signing before the TLS starts, signing of evidence in the TLS handshake, or more precisely in the authentication phase, and. Finally, after the signing, uh, after the TLS handshake has finished, that's the post handshake part. And um, this leads to very different kind of security properties as well as performance um, trade-offs. And this covers, in our view, all of the spectrum that um, key exchange within that signing may not be very helpful. So it's mostly done here. Even if it's done here, it, it's kind of uh, still intra. So this is, in our view, representing the whole design options that uh, designers or system architects may have. And compared to this, um, or, or in order to more analyze it in more detail, what we have done is we have a generic protocol considering the client as an attester, which is kind of representing this part, which is uh, the workload being attested client and the other party as the server. Think of it as CAS and uh, this as the workload. And in red is the information which is private, blue, the public information, and the orange here is representing all the logs which the TLS is saving the handshake, uh, handshake logs for each of the messages sent over. And then the generic protocol, what it is saying is that basically I have in the pre and intra handshake an option to send the, the, the evidence uh, which I have computed here, like after signing 
I can send it as part of the certificate message, which is the most appropriate message where it could be um, in for, for these two, because certificate certificate verify is not extendable. And then the other option is, so inside that there are various options, like we could also put it as this extension does not mean necessarily within the, let's say the certificate message, but also could be that this certificate, for example, in RTLS, it extend this certificate message. So this plus is to be read for both this and this. So it could be one of those. And the other design option that is the third one is the post handshake. And the exported key material is um, takes into account the logs up to the server finished. And the client certificate is basically not a part of that exported key material. And that's why we need to take care of somehow this certificate separately. And um, this exported material, this exported key material then becomes a part of the evidence, which in the post handshake has an extra step where it has to transmit this evidence somehow either as a, let's say on the, uh, as an application data or some other layer after the TLS has finished. So this is, so this in this we, we are trying to capture all the three design options and what happens and what kind of security they can provide and um, is, yeah. is ZK is ZKM different from the session keys that result from the session? Sorry, say again. Which which key? So TTLS sessions end with session keys, mm -hmm. right? Um, so is ZKM by session different keys, from... do you mean the session uh, the key with which the client will encrypt the application data is that yeah what? okay yeah 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 so I'm, i don't i think there's four of them you know uh, uh, but are they, they like two of them so client kc and ks which which other yeah two okay you? whatever does it doesn't matter point is you have both both sides end up with with session keys that they use to mm -hmm. encrypt content right EKM is different from those keys or? Yes, it's it's uh, exactly different from that. So the keys which are derived, unless we use the, um, how is it called the, 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 what's the name of the, there is a mode for TLS, which is the pre, not the pre, something like uh, pre-shared keys, unless we use that where we can transmit data somewhere here. So, in the normal mode, like in the certificate, when we are using the certificate-based uh, authentication, so it would be um, the, these keys which you are mentioning are generated at this point in time after the finished. So KC for the client and KS for the server. Mm -hmm. And this key is the, this is the exporter. So, which means that uh, I want to use something from this, um, uh, from the TLS handshake as part of the, um, at, at some upper layer, for example, at an uh, application layer, I can use this to recognize which um, TLS session it is coming from. And both parties can derive the same because they are having the same log as the basis for this. Is, is the idea that the EKM key or keys have lifetime that's lo longer than the session keys? Uh, this I don't know. I will I will look into it. So yeah, uh, Osama, this is this is Gary. Are you using the same definition for EKM that the IETF used when they were, they were defining TLS token binding? Yes. Sure. So you, is, okay. Yeah. 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 So Ned, <laughs> Ned, if you go look up those old, old TLS token binding specs, I'm going off of memory, but EKM is related to the session keys. So and that was act and in in that regard, you could actually you know, you could actually sign payloads with respect to the specific uh, session keys for for a TLS connection. So even if they're like, so even if you have session continuity uh, or PSKs, it still it should still work. Okay. Are you sure, Didi, that it's it's related to these session keys? I'll check. Okay. I, that's why I say I got to check back on it. But okay. I know okay. that I know they use that in the TLS uh, yeah. before before all the browser vendors ripped it out. They mm -hmm. use that in TLS token binding. They use the concept of EKM. So if we are talking about the same keys, I believe the the, the keys will be generated at some. So so these session keys, if you mean the the one with which they will 
encrypt the application data for certificate base, they are generated in my understanding at this point in time when the client is finished. So these keys will be, uh, actually I have a diagram. I can probably just switch to that quickly if I find it. Um, just a minute. Yeah. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have here the key schedule, which is like this. So when I'm talking about the EKM, basically this is the exporter value, which takes into account only up to the uh, server finished log SF, which is the server finished. And I believe if you are calling KC and KS, the application traffic keys, there is no direct connection that I see other than just that they are also derived from the same log. I mean, there is no input from the application keys to the exporter value. Is that is that something that the question again is that if if this is what we are calling as the session keys, they have a common master secret, but otherwise they're different derivation paths so they have the common master secret sure that's that's the same master secret goes to each of them mm -hmm. and it's uh, so the and the same um i forgot what's the third input so this is the label and this is the transcript hash which which it takes as a probably it's called as context or something like that so um yeah the master secret yeah. and the logs are the same yeah, but it says in the requirements, knowing one EKM value should not reveal any useful information about the master secret or any other EKM value. So, yes, mm -hmm. it could come from the same master key, but one, but exporting it, obviously, you don't want to disclose master key. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Is it in this? I posted in the chat window, it's RFC 5705. Oh, 5705, right, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. So, yeah. Mm, the point I wanted to make here was that it could export um, this value which by which inside the evidence it could, for instance, if it wants to reconnect this client, if it wants to reconnect at a later point, it has some, some let's say, secret which it can use to identify that, yes, this was the session with which I could uh, connect to. And also as a, a unique identifier or as a binding basically between this TLS layer and the, and the higher layer to which this is exported at the application layer, for instance, for the post handshake uh, attestation. Okay, um, so for this, um, th in this in this diagram, basically I cover all of them, which means pre, intra, and post. Um, and yeah, um, you just just yeah. a quick question, and you may have answered this before in your previous presentation. So, sure, sure. so I apologize. Is there any concept of uh, delayed verification on the post handshake attestation? Like, for instance, if there is an urgency to initiate a uh, client workload. Um, um, and you don't want to wait around for a verifier, but the verifier could, uh, you know, if you do the delayed verification, then the uh, TOS connection can terminate um, if the verification comes back uh, uh, comes back with a negative result. Or does the verification have to be completed fully in step three? 
Uh, this I'm not sure about, so I have noted it down. I will explore it further. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I mean, that same question could be applied to step two as well, right? Yes, it could. I'm just kind of curious. And uh, I, I'm I'm curious if verification has to be done in line or in the, uh, or or um, or can it be uh, delayed and mm -hmm. allow the TLS connection to go through, but then maybe terminated at a later point in the, uh, you know, as part uh, of the application block. Another way to ask the question is, do any of the logs have attestation results in them? Yes, that's fair. Mm, okay, so I think that probably I can answer. So any of the logs. So if we are talking about post handshake, basically none of them have any information about the evidence because for post handshake, the evidence will be generated after the handshake has finished. So it will be some point at this and none of the logs will contain any information about the evidence. So this, when I add this, this is just for the generic protocol, meaning that it applies to these two. And uh, for post handshake, it doesn't, any of the logs do not have any information on the evidence. So you're, you're saying the evidence in 2.5 doesn't show up in the log CRTC? For post handshake. Because yeah. this, is, this is not there. I that have evidence in, is not in the, that in doesn't the, go into the log? That actually is not there in the post handshake because it is transmitted as a, yeah. as after the, it is even not generated at this point in time. Because. Okay, I guess I'm misreading what that, what that me means. Now. Okay, let me, let me try to rephrase this. So in this, we are trying to cover generic protocol meaning the all the three options that i have explained here mm. and the intention was to show that first let's forget about the three steps so it applies only to post handshake and this ekm also it doesn't matter so for these two options and what we are showing here is that for pre and intra the evidence will be sent in part as part of the certificate message or is one good option to send it here and for post handshake, it will be sent as after the, and even generated after this TLS handshake has finished so that the client finished is done. So, which is basically- Okay, I think, yeah, I get that. I, it was the yeah. one with the evidence in the certificate. It, it, does the certificate contribute to the, the log then? So the question is now, which log? Uh, do you mean this, this log for this? Yeah, I'm not sure how to read the diagram, but- you okay, know, so so each log kind of the way the protocol works is every handshake message produces some value that goes into a log. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and it's a rolling log. Yeah, it's a rolling log, and the log shown here means that this is the log of this message. That is, this message yeah. has already been put into this. So okay. when I write log CRC CRTC, so this is taking this into the hash of uh, M1, M2, M3 up to this point, all of them yeah. are part of this, okay. this log. Yes, so that includes the certificate and this, if the certificate has, yes. has evidence, it would include the evidence. Uh, only for pre and intra, not for mm -hmm. post. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, then, the, then the case for scone is that it is post handshake, that is, the evidence will be generated somewhere here using the value, which is this exported key material. Um, and the way it works is that, as Ned just mentioned, so this evidence will be removed. That is, it will not be used anymore. So 2.5 reduces to just the certificate uh, for this key, which is in case of SCONE is the ephemeral key for this, uh, which is representing the TLS. Hey, hey Osama. Yeah. So, sorry to interrupt, but before you... Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. too, 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 too far off. I'm, I'm, I'm digesting the conversation just happened mm -hmm. and I'm looking at this evidence where is, I'm thinking about the question, can we continue going, you know, uh, asynchronously essentially while verification happens and then basically if verification fails, then do something in the future to basically unravel things. Where in this flow does ver verification happen? Because that uh, I'm just thinking evidence is just the raw attestation evidence and where where does verification happen? 
Okay, so basically you are saying that evidence uh, by verification, you mean the appraisal of this evidence, right? Yeah, so there's evidence in my mind is mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's some uh, some party presents some evidence and says, based on this, trust me, right? Yeah. And so that's that that's what that means to me. And to keep the conversation simple, let's leave aside post handshake. Let's just think about the one where okay. mm -hmm. you know pre pre and intra. So where we have at this where we have this evidence going in this this certificate. So does like that step two point five happen before or after verification of that evidence happens? Two point five definitely happens before verification because the client as the attester it is. Uh, sending over the evidence as part of this message. So the mm -hmm. verifying relying party, if I understood your question correctly, can only verify once it has this evidence. It will receive it as part of 2.5. Talking about only this, forgetting okay. about post. Yeah. So it can happen somewhere on after receiving this 2.5. And since they are so, in the same flight, so it will happen somewhere here. So if if the so the attest so the the server the relying party here yeah it has access to the evidence after two point five only after two point five yeah only after two point five yeah and then what is the intended if where what what's the what's the flow if they if if verification fails how does it how does that impact the TLS connection? Does it get to step, you know, to, does it get to the step where the session keys are established and shared and then, you know, terminated or how, how is, you know, I, so, I, so there's 2.7 to 3.1 has steps missing, but there's a finished message that comes back the other direction before you get to 3.1. Okay, so that so would be the finished is already here. Oh, um, it's already there. Sorry. So this is from the finished uh, from the client. That, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so uh, it seem, I'm just I'm just echoing what you're saying, Greg. It seems like there's a gap there. Yeah, it seems like the purpose, the part of what this has to handle is allowing the relying party to basically, I would think, not even allow the TLS connection to complete if if the mm -hmm. attestation evidence is not trusted. I, I wouldn't want any, uh, you know, I wouldn't want any sliver of time where the TLS session was complete and some information could be shared that I didn't want to have shared, you know, until the verification is complete. So where, yeah. I, I, so so, yeah. so I think either side could drop the connection at any point. So 2.4, 2 the client could say, that didn't verify, drop connection. And a 2.7, so wait, wait, wait. Could say didn't verify, drop the connection. No, three point seven is left to right, right? So two point five, six, assume... seven are all going from client to so let's assume yeah. that this is the one directional attestation. For instance, only the client is the attester, and this is the verifying relying party. So in two point four, it cannot so the client doesn't need to be verify anything. Let's say that there is no evidence within this. It's not verifying, let's say it's not mutual attestation. In that case, um, I think the appraisal will happen somewhere over here, and it's uh, it can be incorporated in the. Definitely, I can I can show it somewhere here. I yeah. think the how the what, appraisal what, of this happens. What, I, what I'm saying is, in the, in a tra traditional TLS <clears throat> interaction without attestation, mm -hmm. there are points where either side could drop the connection as a way of enforcing. Uh, that that something failed, the verify failed, right? So if a yeah. certificate verify fails in either direction, yeah, you know the the way that you enforce that is you drop the connection, right? That's right. So that behavior still exists. the 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 question is, is it assumed that when that attestation evidence is, you know, introduced? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that evidence being verified along with the rest of the certificate and other imp information? And is the enforcement mechanism to <clears throat> the same? In other words, it's to drop the connection if the verify fails, the, the evidence or verify fails. Right. So I haven't, uh, to be honest, explored this, but I will check out so that mm -hmm. whether 
the dropping the connection happens or not for all of the three, uh, at least these two cases. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I haven't actually explored that for now, since, you know, until now. So, okay. so Nan, I think what you're saying is this conversation here in my, in my head, uh, uh, I'm not a TLS expert, so forgive me if I say some silly things, but as I understand it, the precursor to this whole conversation here is a TCP IP connection is formed. And then this is a conversation on top of the TCP IP connection. And right. I think what Ned is saying is if you get to after step 2.5 here and you're on the, the, the server side of this TCP, IP, TCP connection, TCP IP yeah. connection, if you determine that verification fails, you can at a lower level terminate the TCP IP connection altogether. Yeah. And so and now I get that. Thank you. Does it, it seems a little odd if we're enlightening the TLS protocol to understand at the station evidence to have a, a very, um, this is not a super edge case, right? This is like, you know, you, you have uh, at the station evidence and you evaluate it and it goes one of two ways. And it's, it's a, it's, it's the two primary flows. It succeeds and X happens or it fails and Y happens. It seems bizarre that the path for the second uses a, a uses a mechanism, you know, at a much lower level in kind of the protocol stack. It's, it seems like we've enlightened this, we've, we've partially enlightened the TLS protocol that handles the positive case for um, setting up connection, uh, setting up the tested connection, but we haven't enlightened it for the um, the the negative. But maybe that's just the way, as you point out, well, TLS works, and that's well, accepted. yeah. So the the thing that's in, the interesting uh, the aspect of that is <clears throat> if you look at things like AR4SI and some of the other proposals for how to represent attestation results, they're not necessarily binary, you know, like like pass mm -hmm. fail. Right, but the mechanisms mm -hmm. that are built in or assumed by TLS are pass fail. Right, so then if you get mm -hmm. a a gray, if you if the answer to attestation is some gray value, not black and white, but your only enforcement mechanisms are black and white, then what does that mean? Yeah, that's right. another uh, 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 another interesting aspect to this. Um, yeah, it, that, that, that's an interesting question. But but I, I think an orthogonal question to what I'm asking, or, or I'm not even asking, I'm just perhaps getting educated in, in TLS. It's perhaps it's it's a standard way and just the whole way that TLS works if at any point do you determine that the connection makes no, you, you don't want to go forward. You just, you know, uh, terminate the TCP IP connection. If that's the 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 practice, then I'm just the, then yeah, I'm just being educated here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, proceeding forward, like for the protocol for scone, as I said, the certificate does not contain any evidence, and correspondingly to this ephemeral key, the certificate verifier will be signed via the private part of this key. And that's the only change compared to this protocol. And uh, among the things which are unspecified, as I said, there is a there is a lot of things. There are a lot of things which are unspecified within the scone how it works. It's unclear how the evidence is actually transmitted, which is like uh, this step three point one, how it actually is done. It is unclear from the specs. And is now. That are you referring, is that a reflection on the TLSA internet draft or something no, else? No, no, so, so it's, uh, no, it's not about internet draft. So that lies in the intra handshake thing. Mm -hmm. And this is only about SCONE, which is, um, SCONE uses a post handshake compared to intra handshake. And okay. when I'm saying this, it's unclear. In that, I think it's pretty much specified. So for intra, we actually use it at part of the certificate message and, uh, both for both the because normally <laughs> step three like normally step three is like when you do HTTP like if you're an HTTPS protocol mm -hmm. you do the you do the TLS handshake and then step three is HTTP 
And so you would look at whatever your application, your whatever your HTTP protocol says is the mm -hmm. the message that goes back and forth. And but then you're you know there's this whole set of other kinds of internet drafts for specifying you know, media type and other stuff that potentially could come into play here. Yeah. So that's that's basically our point that there are there could be possibly multiple options and one has to specify how this step of transmission is actually done, which protocol layer does it use, or is it sent as part of even the application data of the of the let's say after establishing the keys, the KC and KS, which I showed previously, is it just sent as an application data? And encrypted via the key that the client has generated as part of the TLS handshake, and um, it's completely unspecified. Yeah. So what's so I'm mis I'm potentially misreading your slide with three point one, mm -hmm. in that you're in, you're trying to say that there's an extension to the TLS handshake exchange, no, no, no. It's, which it's, adds. No, this... no, it's not an extension. So it's just okay. showing via this green color that it's. Um, firstly, the green color is showing that it's only applicable for post handshake attestation. And secondly, it's uh, not a message in the TLS handshake, which is the only two steps are now finished. That is the TLS handshake has actually okay at this point in time. So it is after the TLS handshake that it signs at some point of time between uh, yeah. this and this. Okay. And so that's at some other layer, it is sending the evidence. That, okay, that's just confusing me because they didn't have a a bright delineation and you just named it 3.1 but really there's a big a, a big line there that says everything below 2.7 is application specific protocol mm -hmm. and then logically within application specific protocol there's something that that could contain evidence but it's right. it's not technically it's not that it isn't defined it's just that it could be defined by lots of things mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah. sure yeah, and that kind of gets back to what I was saying. If TLS handshake uh, needs to complete um, in a certain amount of time to meet some sort of quality of service assurance on the client side, particularly, then it would be better if you have the uh, post handshake attestation and that handed it to handle the application level instead of the uh, if the attestation fails, even though it's even though the application, or sorry, the attestation doesn't verify, even though the application is started, um, the TLS connection can be terminated in any instant in time by the server, right? So that, so it's not critical for the attestation to be evaluated before the application starts. But, but I think there's potential for a problem if, the, if evidence, the first evidence in 2.5 differs from the evidence in 3.1. Yes, that, but that would actually, uh, I would think that would be a bonus, right? Because the, uh, because the, uh, because I mean, if the evidence is different between the two, or the, you know, if there, then it's actually uh, give the server, uh, you know, some information on the security state of the client of the application, then because the application is providing three point one, right? It's providing the evidence in three point one. That's that's not part of the TLS actually. Oh. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so the fir the first evidence is part of their log, but if nobody uh -huh. checks the log, then it's like you know you can prove that the second evidence was protected by the handshake as as detailed in the log, but that doesn't mean that the log isn't telling you something interesting about maybe you've been attacked. Not, so I, the think a, I think there is a there is a confusion when you say two evidences. So it's. The slide is showing two evidences, but they are mutually exclusive. Either there will be this evidence or this. If we use pre and intra handshake, there will be this evidence. Or if we use post handshake, there will be this evidence. I think I need to somehow rephrase it well, because there is maybe this confusion. So there will never be two evidences. So, so I was thinking in the context of certificate being something like a die certificate where the evidence was was issued in this, you know, the certificate was generated in a timely fashion where the evidence mm -hmm. was taken, you know, based on what was available at the time. And, and then you can't, 
you can't opt you can't sort of throw stuff out of the certificate because it's signed so if it's mm -hmm. in there it's got a, it stays in there and it ends up being in the log whether you like it or not but you don't have to verify it yeah but it's still in the log and then that's intra right so it's no longer a post so then if, if you send even a dice certificate inside this message mm -hmm. then it will be intra right intra what do you mean by that so, so by intra i mean that this is you are, you are sending the your definitely you need to sign it before you send it and yeah that would mean that basically it should be ready before the tls finishes the tls handshake finishes which is at this point in time so when you are saying that this is this evidence is dice or whichever certificate it is so when this evidence is part of this certificate it is either pre or intra so this i think the case that you are mentioning is kind of intra that we generate the evidence here Sign it I'm just I'm just process. saying that the, the 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 evidence has the same semantics as any other data field in the certificate, mm -hmm. right? So if it's if they if you're exchanging a certificate, the certificate was issued prior to the handshake being started, mm -hmm. and the information in the certificate is relevant to you know the something that defines the endpoint, and uh, but you don't have to verify it. You know whether mm -hmm. it's evidence or whether it's you know a subject subject and name or you know some other extension <clears throat> the verifier doesn't have to verify those values but it can say i checked the signature over this information and the signature is good but i didn't look at any of the information right. nevertheless you're going to take the whole bit of the whole certificate and put it into the log even if you don't look at it right mm -hmm. So the so the evidence there is no different from any other field in the certificate. You should have a log of it, and that log goes into the into the you know the key binding for the session keys. So so you can say yeah this information is bound to this session. But like I like I keep saying, you, you, there's no sort of you know someone has to look at it eventually. Yeah. And so when I'm I'm suggesting is that that down the road, the application that's looking at the evidence in 3.1 has the opportunity to compare it with the evidence that was logged in 2.5 and see if they differ. Because mm -hmm. it, you know, it could it could be that if there's a difference, then maybe the handshake was done in an environment that was an attacked environment, in which case you can't trust what's in 3.1, or maybe the other way around, it was attacked. You know, post 2.7, pre 3.1, and so now you're look. You, the handshake's good, but you're you're still looking at a an attacked environment for everything else. But I think they're different bits of information, and I don't think they're optional. You can't so, just you can't just say, "Hey, take the subject." You know, I don't like you know subject names, I only want to use subject alt names, and so I'm going to throw away the subject name in my certificate and only use that. I mean, that's not an option, right? It's, it's everything signed. So I think what you are proposing is kind of a mixture between the two of these, that I use this evidence also as part of 2.5 and also mm -hmm. as part of a post handshake which is uh, this message right right i don't i don't I'm not say i fully understand kind of the terminology they're using for pre and intra handshake that's sort of some you know it's you're you're using it to sort of analyze the structure in some way which is fine um but i'm just saying like you, the the, the logs contain an information of everything and the logs don't go away. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, I got to uh, jump in here. Um, we're over time. Yeah. So um, if, if we want to continue this conversation, we'll have to do it in, in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Osama, were you close to being done here or did you have more to go through? No, I had more, but uh, I'm fine if we can, we can, if there are some other topics, uh, it's fine. I can present in some future meeting. That's uh, yeah. I, I, at the moment, I don't think there's anything for a couple of weeks out from now. So if you want to continue this in, in a couple of weeks, I think the time is available for you. So why don't you, um, if, if you say you want to do that, I'll, I'll put the topic on the agenda for next time. Yeah, uh, it's fine. I can, I can present. Okay. All right. And Ned, just one, um, 
I think the spirit of what's called post handshake is just acknowledging that a uh, two parties can basically establish a test uh, in, in a tested channel on top of TLS at the app layer and have no, you know, use TLS as it stands today. That's how I think of it. And so, sure. yeah, I, yeah. I, right. You could, you could say, I'm going to use regular certificates, uh, establish a TLS session that's authenticated, but not attested and then introduce Whatever attestation want, over yeah. that secure channel. Sure. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. yeah but, but that's conceptually what it represents to me. And, and okay. Uh, yeah, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't clear to me. In this uh, I right, right. think it, at least in my understanding, it doesn't use the standard TLS certificate. So the client, the certificate that the client is sending is a self-signed certificate compared to the CS signed certificate, which is in the typical TLS or standard TLS. So it's at least in my understanding, it's not the standard TLS that that the way it works, that certificate message at least. I mean, in the post yeah. it, you may not have a choice. It's like, you know, the device, if the dice device was built with the dice, you know, certificate chain, that's, and that's the one that's chosen to be used for the TLS handshake, then you don't have a choice. It's just going to be in there. That's just that it's opaque. It ends up being, it sort of ends up being, you know, is it marked critical? If it's non-critical, then it gets to be ignored and it probably will be ignored and the TLS handshake will just move merrily along. If it's marked critical, then some code somewhere has to parse it and decide what to do about it. It might still move merrily along, even if it's marked critical, it just means somebody looked at it. Right, but you can still have the con you can still be in the context of of do the TLS handshake without evidence, and then present the evidence later. So even if evidence is included in the handshake, you made the choice to ignore it. Is I think what Greg is saying effectively. Uh, but I'm just yeah. saying, eh, if the evidence is there, why not check it? Um. Sounds like we have more to talk to in a couple of weeks. I, I have to drop. Yeah. So I look forward to a, a little more discussion in a couple of weeks. And Ned, hopefully you're able to come back also. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks, you. everybody, for. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Greg. For, for today's discussion. Right. We'll talk see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.